Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I hope you had a chance to enjoy some food, some breaks, maybe visits with your family. Uh, we hope that you've been enjoying our morning sessions. Um, we've been really enjoying it ourselves. Uh, it's great to see the chat box. Uh, it's great to see some great questions. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move into the next presentation, again, part two with Dr. Gabor Maté. And before we do that, I'm just a few housekeeping ideas. Just a friendly reminder to fill out your digital passport for digital door prizes. And to remember that uh, you can tweet. So hashtag WPS21 and keep the conversations going. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass the baton to Dr. Gabor Maté. Um, he's gonna provide us with some resources. So thank you, Dr. Maté. Well, welcome back. So there's a couple of books I wanna to mention to you, uh, which. Uh, have helped and certainly have the potential to help a lot more people. Um, one of them is um, called The Way Out by Dr. Alan Gordon. Alan Gordon is himself a physician uh, or a psychologist, I forget which. And he's the head of the Los Angeles Pain and Psychology Center. And he himself suffered from chronic pain, which he resolved from with mind-body approaches. The book is called The Way Out. It was published just a couple of months ago. It's selling very well on Amazon, so I highly recommend it. It's actually got a practical method for you to deal with your chronic pain. It's a practice. It'll take you some investment of time to do it, but you can do it at your own leisure in your own home, and it doesn't. it's not like it takes years. It takes a month or so, and you'll see a difference. That's one book. Another book I mentioned is called The Yoga and Science in Pain Care. And um, this is uh, written by um, physiotherapists uh, here in Canada. And um, it sums up much of the science of chronic pain and introduces the yoga techniques to, to deal with it. The third is the work of Dr. John Sarno. That may be a name that's familiar to many of you, S-A-R-N-O. He died a few years ago in his 90s. He was a very vigorous and original thinking physiatrist, a rehabilitation medical specialist who dealt with chronic back pain. And guess what? He found that a lot of the pain he was dealing with was actually psycho-emotional in uh, origin. And he found, like I found in my practice, that you'd have an MRI done or, or a scan done or an x-ray done. And then somebody would tell you, you got this pain because of this is what shows on the x-ray. But of course, if you look at like bulging disc, for example, well, bulging discs sometimes can cause specific pain, usually not in the back, but in the leg. But if you look at people at age 40 or 50, about half of them will have bulging discs on their scans, but they won't have pain. Which means that very often doctors are operating on people's x-rays rather than on people. And which means that a lot of back surgery is unnecessary and harmful. And there's a friend of mine, uh, Tommy Rosen, his name is, who's a yoga teacher now, and used to be addicted uh, to opiates and other gambling and so on. And he got over his addiction. He was clean for 10 years. And all of a sudden, he developed severe back pain. He could barely stand up. To make a long story short, he, and he wasn't somebody to go see physicians very quickly. Like he, he just was not going to do that. But eventually, he had to because nothing, acupuncture, nothing was helping. Went to see... Uh, medical specialists, surgeons, they were told, you'll be on medication for the rest of your life. And sooner or later, you're gonna have, within the next half year, so you're gonna have surgery, otherwise you won't be able to walk. Well, Tommy is completely free of pain now, never had the surgery, isn't on any medications. He went to see a certain yogi and through mindfulness meditation, he healed his pain so many of those stories and Sarno found just like I found in my family practice and again here's the thing it's like all of us physicians I don't know if it was like you for, for you Robert in fact I'd be curious to find out 
did you know these things going to medical practice or did you have to kind of find out from your clients or uh, if you kept your eyes and your ears open, which way was it for you? Oh, definitely uh, eyes and ears. I, I think I had to learn uh, through the, the art of medicine as they, as they talk about, it was yeah. learning, listening. I think what makes a good practitioner is curiosity and, you know, the other part is, is, you know, everything I had been trained on was uh, assessing and looking for PTSD, which my colleagues just simply don't do. So mm-hmm. when we added childhood experiences and PTSD, it was unbelievable what came back to us. Yes. So, so many of us, and we've talked about this earlier, because of the gaps in medical education, have to figure these things out for ourselves based on what we see. And then we think we're all alone. And then we look at the literature. We're not all alone. Other physicians have also discovered it. But it's almost like a Bermuda Triangle where things are present and they sink without a trace. So Sarno also saw that a lot of the back pain that people were debilitated by was actually based on psychological, emotional stresses and repressed emotions. And he called that myoneuronal syndrome, uh, myo meaning muscles, neuronal, the nerves, and how the emotions affecting the nerves would affect the muscles. There'd be pain. So it's not that people were imagining the pain. The pain was real, but the pain was caused by tension and stress and trauma. So I recommend Sarno's work. Uh, I recommend, uh, again, his Alan Gordon book, The Way Out. Uh, my books have already been mentioned. Um, so there's a lot of information out there now for the lay public that's easily available. And the, whether you're professionals or whether you're here because you're a chronic pain sufferer, check out these resources. And for the physicians listening here, well, first of all, the physicians listening here or the, medic, the healthcare professionals working here are self-select, listening to this podcast, are a self-selected group. They're already open to this information. The people that should be hearing it are the ones who are not here. But that's kind of uh, that's kind of how it works. But people sometimes ask me, well, what do I do? My doctor doesn't believe in the mind-body connection. They don't think my stress has anything to do with any of my illness. What I say to people is, if you go to a butcher shop, would you ask for a birthday cake? Or if you went to a bakery, would you ask for a cut of steak no i wouldn't why because they don't sell it there i'm saying to you when you go to a medical doctor go for what they can do Hmm. but don't go for what they can't do and don't let the fact that your physician isn't particularly open to this perspective invalidate it or invalidate your own gut feelings and your own experience just see him or her or they for who they are which is they're trained in a particular way of thinking about things they can do wonderful things within that model, but that model is narrow and far from inclusive from the wide swath of evidence and possibility that's really out there. So the, rather than resenting physicians for what they don't know, receive and accept that, that part of what they do know that makes sense to you and look elsewhere. Mm-hmm. So that's what I was going to say by way of resources. Well, thanks for that. You know, it was one thing that you've mentioned a couple of times is on spinal pain, spine surgery. Uh, We developed a program here in in Calgary where uh, what we did is prior to spine surgery, everybody had to come in and get tested uh, for mental health, for uh, addiction, looking for uh, those underlying causes, as you mentioned, MNS. Uh, And what we found is when we incorporated... uh, you know, these are modifiable risk factors for poor surgical outcomes. We know this. This is all over the data. Yet I hear uh, my biomedical colleagues all the time saying, well, we don't really know what to do. Well, we do. We know what the modifiable risk factors are and we modify them. So what are those risk factors? Mental health trauma, anxiety, depression, which anxiety and depression are often still related to childhood trauma. So we incorporated acceptance commitment therapies. Mm -hmm. Uh, We started getting to a lot of the roots of what was going on. We actually had people walking out and not getting the surgery. 
Yeah. Uh, now we have a great team of surgeons here in Calgary that, you know, if it's not surgically indicated, we ain't doing it, period. Yeah. Uh, and having a long wait list kind of helps with that. But now what we're doing is we're not just uh, focusing on, on the biology, but on all aspects. So what you said earlier, people getting spine surgeries that are unnecessary, the amount of people we had to treat who went to Germany or the U.S. to get their surgery because someone in Calgary wouldn't do it. Uh, and then we end up having to clean up the mess afterwards because it did not go very well and nobody's there to support them. So these transitional pain services, the future of surgical outcomes uh, really are about assessing and treating the underlying mental health causes. When somebody's distressed, they tighten up. How good is that? for a, a, a spine that has back pain, uh, for any sort of arthritic pain, for anything at all. And then that's not even talking about what you mentioned, the immunology and the changes in stress hormones that add to inflammatory factors. Uh, are really brilliant. Now, I know Christelle had another question coming back from the earlier session. So I'm going to throw it over to Christelle. Thanks so much. It's so interesting to see these discussions unfold. So thank you. Um, Dr. Mate, you mentioned insecure attachments. And yesterday, we actually had several speakers who spoke on reflections of equity, diversity and inclusion. And our Indigenous uh, speaker, Dr. Carol Hopkins, spoke about attachment and the importance of the sense of belonging and hope to study different patient outcomes, person outcomes. And so the question is around those insecure attachments. So you mentioned a connection between chronic pain and insecure attachments. Oh. And so the person asking this question and kind of leading us well into the next day from yesterday's discussion asked, wondering if you could speak a bit more about what that connection looks like between those insecure attachments and chronic pain. Okay. So you know they study one one way of doing attachment studies is to look at how children interact with their parents under certain situations. So a very famous strange situation study is when a mom and a young child are in a room together, a stranger enters, the mom might even leave and then come back again and the, the child is upset. Um, securely attached kids will go to their mothers right away and they'll be sued by the mother. Insecure attached kids, um, there's various categories of insecure attachments. I can never keep them straight in my head, but insecure attachments, basically, they either won't go to their mothers or if they do, they're not sued by the mother's words or, or caresses. And so they're, they're not securely attached. So this is, you know, now, the, the frightening thing is there's also not frightening or illuminating thing. There's also something called the adult attachment interview, right? Interview adults in, in a way to elicit their mode of attachment. In other words, how they related to their caregivers in childhood. The adult attachment interview can predict how the as yet unconceived child of that adult will be at one year of age on a strange situation. Now, if you follow that, in other words, the attachment style of the adult long before they have kids can predict how their unborn kids will be like with attachment because we pass on our attachment patterns to our kids until we figure them out and, 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 and resolve them. <clears throat> so insecure attachment is basically when a child just doesn't feel safe enough with the parent. Now this shows up, I, I think I alluded to this before. If I didn't, let me just make it clearer again. When it comes to child abuse, for example, let's say sexual abuse, when you ask somebody, and some of you may get triggered by this, just be aware of that. I'm talking about something painful. But when I ask people who were sexually abused, how long did it go on for? They'll say, oh, weeks or months, sometimes years. Usually by somebody they knew, if at always by somebody they knew, either in the family or just outside the family or any extended family. <coughs> then the next question is, and people always think that the sexual abuse was the trauma. And I'm saying, no, there was a trauma before then. 
there was an attachment trauma. Because the next question is, who did you talk to about it? And the answer is almost invariably, nobody. Which means that by the time the abuse happened, their attachment relationship had been disrupted sufficiently that they didn't feel safe enough to go to their parents. Or if it's the father doing it, to go to their mothers. Or if it's the mother doing it, to go to their fathers. In other words, there was no secure attachment figure in their lives with whom they felt safe. That trauma preceded the sexual abuse. Not only did it precede it, it even made it possible. And not only did it even make possible, it actually was a signal that the abuser could always pick up on because abusers can tell with laser-like accuracy who is vulnerable and who isn't. I've seen this in medical practice. I've seen doctors abuse their patients. There was a gynecologist in my building in East Vancouver, prominent gynecologist. I'd refer patients to him, obstetrician. Turned out he'd been seriously abusing his clients, sometimes egregiously at the first postnatal visit even. And most of this, and this went on for years and years and years before he was found out, investigated, and expelled from the profession. A lot of his patients were flabbergasted. They said, he was always the perfect gentleman with me. Never even looked at me the wrong way. Well, why do you think not? Because he could tell. Not because the person wanted it, deserved it, or invited it, but because their vulnerability was like a red signal on their foreheads. And that vulnerability was based on their lack of boundaries. And those lack of boundaries were based on their childhood attachment um, wounds. So attachment is that connection, safety. And again, to go back to what I said about expectations, it's not that we have expectations to be safe. We were born as an expectation to be safe. If there hadn't been safety for us during evolution, we would not have evolved. So we were born as an expectation for safety. When those expectations are lost or betrayed because of parental stress, parental trauma, parental upset, then a child doesn't feel secure in the world. And now they're set up to suffer more trauma and stress and chronic pain. So that's why insecure attachment is related to chronic pain. Thank you. Um, I know this is, um, you know, deep and meaningful uh, discussions and I think I'm glad we're having these. Um, could we move into one more question regarding uh, childhood um, trauma sure. and then I'll, I'll definitely throw to Rob and then we can proceed. Um, a person thoughtfully said, um, I'm curious if you've observed a pattern of chronic disease in children with that background and what your thoughts are on how the child welfare system and the healthcare system could collaborate more effectively to minimize or mitigate the effects of trauma before they develop into disease. Yeah. So preventative. Yeah. <clears throat> so the things I've said about adult illness, um, the autoimmune diseases, the malignancies and so on, um, they've been well studied in adults. They've been far less well studied in childhood. So when I'm talking about the adult population, I'm on very firm scientific ground. When I'm talking about ch children, I'm giving you more impressions than science. Although there is some science as well. So there was one Japanese study of kids with leukemia, by the way, who showed less secure attachments with their parents. This is difficult stuff to talk about because parents immediately perceive themselves as being blamed. But of course, I'm not blaming anybody for anything. I'm just saying this is what has been observed.
Now, I can tell you one example that has been well and thoroughly studied in childhood, which is asthma. So we know that the more stress there is in the parental environment, significantly the greater the risk of a child's asthma. There's no, I mean, there's multiple studies on that. In fact, again, stress and even in the wound comes into it. So about asthma, we know that. Now it's interesting, how do we treat asthma? Rob, I'll give you a skill testing question. How do we treat asthma? Got a pharmacist uh, here too. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll pass it to the pharmacist, but no. you know, we okay. puffers, either uh, rescue or steroids. Okay, so what, what's in the puffers? Steroids, you said. There's either steroids in the puffer or there's a copy of adrenaline in the puffer, right? So we dilate the narrowed airways by means of the adrenaline analog, and we settle the inflammation by means of the steroid that you mentioned. Now, what are adrenaline and steroids in nature? They are stress hormones. So we're treating asthma with stress hormones. To go beyond that, not only do we treat asthma with stress hormones, we treat everything under the sun with stress hormones. If you have inflammation of your joints, what do you get? Corticosteroids. Inflammation of your intestine, what do you get? Corticosteroids. Or your lungs, your nerves, as in multiple sclerosis, what do you get? Corticosteroids. Of your skin, as in ex eczema or psoriasis, what do you get? Corticosteroids. In other words, we're treating everything under the sun with stress hormones. You would think we might want to ask ourselves, gosh, does stress have something to do with the onset of this condition? And of course it does. And what happens in chronic stress is that the stress apparatus itself gets exhausted. It's almost like we become resistant to our own stress hormones. Now we have to give you extra stress hormones to keep your body out of inflammation. So there's a clear correlation between a lot of chronic conditions and stress and trauma. I'll go back to the question about childhood. So we, this is true in childhood asthma. So we know that for sure. That's not in doubt. When it comes to so-called mental health conditions, again, there's no doubt. So that the more stress there is during and after pregnancy and in early childhood, the greater the risk for depression, anxiety, um, ADHD, every manner of childhood mental health condition. So when it comes to asthma and mental health conditions, we have studied and have documented the relationship. When it comes to illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis uh, in childhood or childhood diabetes and so on, it's less clear in terms of, it's just not been studied that much. My impression though, from my, what I've seen in the world is that, yeah, there's a real relationship between multi-generational family trauma and stress and childhood illness. And again, I need to say that without blaming anybody because nobody deliberately stresses their kids. It's just that as a parent, I know myself that the traumas and stresses I had not worked out by the time I had children, I passed them on to my kids unwittingly, unconsciously, without any deliberation. And despite the fact that I loved them as much as I could love anybody or anything. And, um, but because I was a workaholic, uh, stressed, depressed physician, that's who showed up for my kids when they were small. So I passed it on. So there's no blame here. But if we understood all this, then again, we come back to the question of what kind of social setup we would like to organize to protect children. Well, it would mean that we would, um, in the indigenous communities, spend big bucks on trauma treatment and trauma prevention. Not to make sure we'd make sure that people have good drinking water, which is if you're an indigenous person in Canada is not yet a given, not everywhere. Now, more recently, there's been some advances there, but my God, there've been decades in the making. And do um, you think there's no reason? 30% of our J population is indigenous. They make up 5% of the population. Why? Because they've been so brutally traumatized by this society and continue to be. So 
it's not a question of are we going to spend money because we already are spending money on corrections and long-term treatment of mental health and physical health conditions in a child welfare system which unfortunately is too often too punitive and it's all about separating the kids rather than reintegrating and, 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 and healing the family system. It's not a question of do we want to spend money, it's a question of are we going to spend it on effects or as Rob said earlier, are we going to spend it on roots, are we going to nip the flowers off the dandelion or do we deal with it at the root? That, that's the only question. It is such a great question. Uh, and you know, we've talked about the system. We've talked about the education system, the healthcare system, governments. What about people with lived experience, people living with pain, people living with chronic illness, people living with addiction? Um, we live in a society where there's a pharmacy on every corner open 24 hours a day, believing there must be a pill to take everything away. How do we how do we shift acceptance into people uh, looking for support that maybe there's alternative ways of, of getting help where the focus on, on the psychological and the sociological pieces are as important, if not more important often than just the biomedical. And that, you know, that there is some repression, some suppression, uh, trauma, anger, um, how do we how do we get more of that acceptance so people are are literally demanding that treatment that they want the support because right now uh, you know one of the things I talk about with anesthesiology and with uh, other uh, specialists that aren't trained uh, in mental health is that oh my patients don't want that. I see it in addiction all the time, that movement towards the biomedical process. A pill will solve everything. That, that is uh, absolutely false. And we know that from the treatment provider. Uh, yet that's the movement. Give them a place to, to use and give them the drugs that they want and we'll be fine. Uh, treatment doesn't work. Uh, we, we see it in, in uh, patients coming in who just want, I need a medication to take my pain away. How do we transition this process? Well, funny you should mention anesthesiologists because as far as I understand, and I've been told this recently, I haven't checked it out, amongst medical physicians, they have the highest rate of suicide, um, which I think speaks to something, uh, which I won't go into now. But any anesthesiologist will tell you, any anesthesiologist with their eyes open will tell you that it's not just the medications they provide. If they come in before, and they meet the patient, and they may put a hand on the patient's arm, and they say, how are you today? Tell me a little bit about what brought you here. That makes such a difference to that patient's experience. And my guess is this is gonna make a difference to that patient's post-op experience as well. And a lot of anesthesiologists do this, by the way, not because they learned it, but just because instinctively they, they do this. Let me answer your question by, going into the broader question of addiction. So I, I will speak about addiction as an example of where we could realize the question that you just raised. And then I'll come back to answering the question itself. Okay. Because for the most part, in um, medicine, we treat addictions with the biomedical model, we give Somebody say opiate addicted, we might give them an opiate substitute like suboxone or methadone, which are, which is, are great, I'm totally in favor of them. Um, and we might trend them to sort of behavior modification treatments. But in my mind, we don't deal with what's underlying the addiction. So in this society, addictions have being looked at from two perspectives. The widely accepted and legally entrenched social, societal perspective is addiction is a bad choice. These people are just morally deficient or they're stupid or they lack willpower. And that's what the problem is. If only they made better choices, they would say no. Matthew Reagan's famous slogan, just say no. The legal system is based on that. 
if people weren't making choices, what are we doing punishing them for using drugs or for possessing drugs or for selling drugs to make money to buy drugs which are illegal otherwise? So the legal system is based on this idea of choice. The average lawyer has got zero idea about trauma. They never hear the word in law school any more than most physicians hear it in medical school, for that matter. So the legal system is based on this idea of choice for which people are culpable and therefore they need to be punished. And that's why 30% of the people in our jails in Canada are First Nations origin. In other words, we punish the traumatized is what we're doing through our legal system. So when they call it a criminal justice system, I agree. It is a criminal justice system because it hurts the vulnerable. That's what it does. So that's one idea, the idea of choice. Then there is the biomedical model that addictions are a brain disease caused largely by genetics. Now that's a step forward, isn't it? Because at least if somebody's got a genetic brain disease, you're not going to blame them for it. You're not going to punish them for it. In fact, you're going to have some compassion for them and you're going to treat them and you're going to grant them some dignity. And if they relapse, given they have this chronic disease, you're not going to punish them any more than you'd punish somebody who relapses with multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis. Because you realize that the remission and relapse are to be expected in a chronic disease. That's all great and it's true, but it doesn't make it accurate. So I'm going to give you a definition of addiction that I don't think anybody can argue with. And as you're listening, just ask yourself if this might apply to you or not. I can tell you already in advance, it certainly has applied to me. So an addiction, it's a complex psychological, physiological process, which manifests in any behavior that a person craves because it provides temporary relief or pleasure but then incurs negative consequences in the long term and one doesn't give it up despite negative consequences. So that's an addiction. Any behavior that the person provides pleasure or relief in the short term and therefore one craves causes negative consequences in the long term and one doesn't give it up. That's what an addiction is. Now, you see, I didn't say anything about drugs, did I? I said any behavior. So it could certainly involve, and often does, substances, nicotine, alcohol. By the way, if somebody would like to explain to me why it's legal in this country to kill yourself with alcohol, but it's not legal to kill yourself with heroin, I don't know. I'd like, to, I'd like somebody to explain that, the rationale behind that. As a matter of fact, as a side issue, I'll tell you something. If you give me a thousand people with severe chronic alcohol problem, and a thousand people who inject heroin four times a day, as long as they don't overdose, at the end of 10, 20 years, which group do you think will be suffering more deaths and much more chronic illness? It'll be the alcohol group. So by what arbitrary standard did we decide to punish these people and to make that one a profitable activity? See, none of it makes any sense. But to go back to my definition. So it would be any behavior, substance related, nicotine, caffeine, heroin, crystal meth, cocaine, fentanyl, sniffing glue, whatever. Or it could be behaviors like sex, gambling, pornography, um, uh, shopping, eating, bulimia, self-cutting, work, extreme sports, almost anything. The issue is not the activity. The issue is your internal relationship to it. So you can use drugs without being addicted. And you can also be addicted without using drugs. So that's the definition. Again, craving pleasure, relief in the short term, 
negative consequence, difficulty giving it up. That's what an addiction is. When I ask yourself now, all of you who are listening here, ever in my life, according to this definition, have you had an addictive pattern? Okay. And um, since I don't see the chat line here, um, I'm going to assume that a lot of people put their hands up because uh, they always do, unless we have a very unique, the healthy group here, or a bunch of liars, one or the other two, you know. Uh, but usually a lot of people put their hands up. And what, what I'm going to ask now is not what you were addicted to, what behavior, what substance, what it was, or when, or for how so long. I don't care about that. I'm just going to ask you one question. What did it give you in the short term that you liked? What was right about it? Not what was wrong with it. We know what was wrong with it. What was right about it? What did it give you in the short, short term? Would it be possible to get some of those answers in the chat line and Christelle, maybe you could read them out to me? So what did it give you that you liked, appreciated in the short term? Okay. Sure. No, that sounds really good. Rob, I'm going to rely on you because I know that you have the chat box open. Um, we make a great oh, okay. here. That's okay. That's okay. And um, I'll ask to actually rely on my team in the background too to provide me with any input too. So thanks. Okay. Um, this is a good question to ask and I hope it stirs all a lot of conversation. So go ahead, Rob. Yeah, absolutely. Here's some answers we have. Joy, comfort, numbing, peace, distraction. Very good. Let's start with that. We could take Drowsy a relaxation, a change in symptoms. Uh, they're they're flying good. in now. Yeah, yeah. So joy, joy, is that mm -hmm. a good thing or a bad thing? Is numbing. When do people need to be numbed? When they're in pain. Mm. Is the numbing of pain a good thing or a bad thing? Is distraction from distressing mental states a good thing or a bad thing? Is relaxation a good thing or a bad thing? People often say a sense of control. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? People say connection with other people. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? In other words, addiction is not a disease. The addiction is your, pro your attempt to solve a problem in your life. That's how it starts. That's simply what it is. It's an attempt to solve the problem of what? Well, all these states, lack of joy, emotional isolation, the emotional distress, these are states of emotional pain. Mm -hmm. And so my mantra here is, the first question is not why the addiction, but why the pain? Now we have to understand people's pain, emotional pain. And by the way, the same part of the brain suffers physical pain as it suffers emotional pain. So there's pain, but then there's the suffering from pain. And so all addictions are an attempt to solve the problem of emotional pain. Now the question is, why? So joy, for example, I mean, have you ever met a healthy infant that doesn't have joy? <laughs> it's a natural attribute of human beings. In fact, of all little mammals, joy. What happened to you that you lost your joy? Something happened. There's no gene for losing joy. What happened to you that you sustained emotional pain? What happened to you that you didn't develop the capacity to regulate your stresses so that you didn't have to resort to external stress reducers like addictions? Something happened. In every case, something happened. So the addiction comes along as an attempt to solve a life problem, the life problem of emotional pain, however that shows up. And that life problem, you didn't incur genetically. It's a product of your life. And in my view, it's a result of childhood trauma. So that's the first point. Now it takes on the characteristics of a disease remission, relapse, physical damage, and all that, but that doesn't make it a disease, which doesn't mean that treating it biomedically in itself is wrong. We've already said that it was necessary sometimes, but it's not the answer. Let me go a bit more into the physiology of pain and addiction. So what do people get addicted to? As we know right now, there's an real epidemic of opioid overdoses, especially with fentanyl. I first began to 
I first learned about fentanyl when I was working in palliative care and it came along as a patch that you put on people so that they have sort of an even absorption of this opiate. And it was, it was a miracle. But as we know, it is a very little, small safety to danger ratio so that a little bit more than helps you will actually kill you. But it's an opiate, it's an artificial opiate. Now, the, uh, uh, the opiates are the most powerful pain relievers that we have, not only of physical pain, but also of emotional pain. Because again, in the anterior cingulate cortex in the brain, there are opiates receptors that helps us soothe pain. So the, the opiates work in our human brain because we have opiate receptors, we have molecules which the opiates can bind to. And the reason we have opiate receptors, as Candace Pert shows in her research, is because we have internal opiates and they're called endorphins, endorphins simply meaning endogenous morphine-like substance. Well, why do we have endorphins? If you want to understand chronic pain, and if you understand addiction, if you want to understand addiction, you've got to understand the role of our natural opiates in our bodies. <clears throat> they do many things. They help to regulate the movement of our, our intestines, which is why if you have an opiate withdrawal, you're going to have diarrhea. Or if you have diarrhea, they'll give you an opiate so that to bind your bowels. So they work in the bowel. They work in the mucos, mucosal membranes. They work in the immune system. But when it comes to chronic pain and addiction, what are their functions in the brain? Three major functions, three. Really important to understand them. First of all, they're pain relievers, as we already said, emotional, physical pain relievers. Now, if somebody finds that they're in chronic emotional pain, which is very often tied to physical pain, as we've been saying all morning. And if they find that heroin or morphine or codeine or some other opiate soothes their pain, just put a, put a sign on the highway that says, just say no to that. Just say no to pain relief. So pain relief. What else do opiates do? Number two, they make possible the experience of pleasure and reward when we feel joy, excitement, uh, or elation. You got a lot of endorphins happening in our brain. Take that away, you lose joy. Just say no to joy and elation and pleasure. Just say no to that. And the third function is the most important one. And we've been talking about it. In fact, I've already mentioned it. They make possible attachment relationships so that when infant and mother or infant and mothering figure are locked in this attuned, blissful gaze, they both have endorphins flowing in their brains. But now recall what I said about brain development. Remember I quoted you that article from Harvard that the architecture of the brain is formed um, Begin, the, 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 uh, the, the growth of it begins before birth and continues into adulthood and establishes either a sturdy or a fragile foundation for all the health, learning, and behavior and follows. Okay, I'm summing up modern brain science in two paragraphs. That was the first one. The second paragraph says, the interactions of genes and experiences, <coughs> excuse me, literally shapes <coughs> the development sorry, literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain and is critically influenced by the mutual responsiveness of adult-child relationships, particularly in early childhood years. In other words, whether or not our endorphin circuits develop properly depends on the quality of our relationship with our caregivers. In a society that undermines that caregiving relationship, is going to generate a lot of people in emotional pain who will then be prone for chronic pain and addictions. It's really that simple. The trauma, of course, is a major disruptor of, of normal uh, brain development. Those are the opiates. The great 
uh, neuroscientist Jack Panksepp, whose work I mentioned before, he, he did a study where they genetically knocked out the endorphin receptors of little mice. These little creatures didn't cry for their mothers when separation, on separation. Now, what would that be in, mean in the wild? If that little infant animal didn't cry for mother on separation, they'd be dead. That's how important the endorphins are for attachment and relationships. So that's one brain circuit that's involved in addiction. Another one has to do with incentive and motivation. So dope, that's a dopamine circuitry. Dopamine, um, we're all dope fiends, you know, because we're all dopamine fiends. We all want that dope of dopamine. We want to feel excited, vital, alive. Dopamine flows when we're seeking uh, food, a sexual partner, exploring a novel environment. We need dopamine to flow. When it doesn't, there's no motivation. There's no incentive. There's a kind of uh, emotional deadness. People do crystal meth and cocaine because they elevate dopamine levels. Now they feel alive. Take, just say no to that. I've already mentioned the stress regulation circuitry, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and its connections to the amygdala and the hippocampus, the structures in the brain. These all develop in childhood. And that development depends on the quality of our emotional interactions with our caregivers. So ultimately, all addictions, whether they're to substances or to behaviors, are pain relievers. Number one and number two, they all function by means of the endorphin and especially the dopamine circuitry of incentive and motivation. So pornography addicts, for example, they're not addicted to pornography as such. You know what they're addicted to? And the gambling addict is not addicted to the money, are they? If they were, if they want a big sum, they would quit, but they're back the next morning, aren't they? You know what they're after? The dopamine hit of the excitement. Why? Because that dopamine circuits have been attenuated during development because of lack of secure attachments. So, whether I look at it, the addictions from a biological point of view, which is the brain function, that biology is not the cause of the addiction, it's a reflection of people's life experience. So when they do these brain scans of adults, yeah, they're looking at real things, but those real things are the product of life experience because the brain is a social organ shaped by our relationships. So then to come back to your question, but then how do we deal with these things? So if somebody comes to me with an addiction issue or a chronic pain issue, I'll ask them, not what's wrong with it. What's what's it? Do? I mean, let's say we stay with the addiction for a minute. Not what's wrong with it. What's it? What's right about it? What does it do for you? Oh, it soothes your pain. Oh, gives you a sense of stress relief. Oh, it numbs your agony. Oh, it relaxes you. I'll say, isn't that wonderful? Don't we all want that? Of course we do. These are normal human qualities that everybody deserves. And the question is, what happened to you? that you no longer have these qualities activated in your life. And so if I'm going to give you Suboxone or Methadone, or if you're a cocaine addict, I actually might give you Ritalin because it also elevates dopamine levels. And a lot of people, by the way, with uh, stimulant addictions are self-medicating ADHD. We know that. About 30% of them are. So there's all these interactions. Um, let's deal with the real issues. So yeah, what do you need biochemically, biomedically? But that's just the first step. As I said earlier, that's just the beginning. Now let's look at what happened to you and how that those events that impacted you in childhood are still impacting you in your self-esteem, in your relationship with others, in your self-confidence, in how you handle stress and so on. Let's go to work on all those issues. Now, implied in your question, Robert, is, is you know, how do we introduce this into the treatment system? Well, I mean, you know this better than I do because I'm no longer in the treatment system. I just get to pontificate online, but you're actually in the trenches. 
and and you're doing it and alan gordon in los angeles is doing it but these are little pockets of sanity i think in a, in a system that overall still doesn't get it but i think the more you guys do it and the more success you have the more convinced our colleagues will be yeah pockets of sanity i i quite like that i'm gonna hang on to that one uh and you know we we do have uh um about 150 or so uh people with lived experience also listening uh so i i do believe that the the best way to create change is to have the people who need the change advocating for it uh so hearing this message and understanding and and you know i often relate pain and addiction uh as not being all that uh dissimilar um you know one's more emotional pain one's more physical pain uh but they're still interlinked with emotional connection and that connection uh, i loved what you said uh opioids often numb out uh the thinking the pain the emotional pain all of it uh and and i teach my my residents and and students all the time is when we're when we're doing an assessment on substances it doesn't matter what area we want to ask what they're doing for them. we don't just go through a list of meds yeah. what does that med do for you right you know and and there may be sometimes yellow flags like oh when i when i take my percocet i get a lot of energy well, we should talk about that and and you know this sounds like it's a positive thing what are the negatives i mean this is classic motivational interviewing um and and for a lot of people there's benefits but again it goes back to the same thing we were talking about before we're treating symptoms and you know whether it's alcohol uh for somebody struggling with trauma and sleep or opioids or methamphetamine or whatever we're treating symptoms whether it's a prescription drug or a non-prescription prescription drug which i always get a kick out of well it's for non-medical use well, you know is it uh we're treating symptoms and and we've got to fix the system uh to start treating uh the causes and and you brought that up nicely before um there there continue to be a plethora of questions coming in so i'm not sure if you want to keep going down the question and answer you know i i my preference is if that's okay with you guys is to take Great. questions yeah absolutely uh so i i know uh there were some questions coming in that christel wanted to ask uh but i do want to to broach this look at one of our lectures coming up later, Dr. Francois Lowe from, from Kelowna is going to be speaking about psychedelics. You brought up psychedelics. We've been talking about trauma and a lot of the evidence in MDMA and, and trauma and the recent phase three that just came out. Uh, I sit on, on some international national panels looking at this. I'm curious of your thought on psychedelics for trauma, but also for pain and, and how it fits into the medical system. Yeah. So um, I, I, I knew nothing about psychedelics until about 12, 13 years ago. I mean, in the 60s, I, I hope no cops are listening, but I took LSD a few times uh, in, the, in the 1960s. But I, was never, I never got into them much. And as a physician, of course, I knew nothing about them. It had nothing to do with them. After my book on addiction came out uh, in the realm of hungry ghosts, people could ask me what I knew about psychedelics in general, specifically ayahuasca, which is a Peruvian or Amazonian plant and addiction, of course, I knew nothing. But then the questions were insistent enough and frequent enough that I said, well, why don't I just find out? And so I began to then uh, work with these modalities and um, boy, have I been impressed um, in their capacity to, no, they're not a panacea. There are no panaceas. They're not the answer. I'm not an evangelist, but they can sure provide a lot of help that often is difficult to find elsewhere. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you about a particular substance, which is not quite illegal in Canada. It's illegal in the States. It's called Iboga, Ibogaine. Um, this is a plant, a root that grows in Gabon in Africa, where it's used by tribal people for ceremonial, spiritual, communal purposes but it's got a particular quality that administered in the right quantity under very expert supervision and a proper medical workup, it can 
obviate withdrawal from opiates. So you could be on heroin for 20 years and do iboga in the proper circumstance. Four days later, you will not have withdrawal symptoms. There's nothing even remotely resembling that in Western medicine. I've seen this. And it's been studied. I mean, it's not like it hasn't been studied. But again, it's why aren't we paying more research? Why aren't we paying more attention to that kind of stuff and doing more research on it? I mean, it would be a lifesaver for thousands of people. Can you imagine? And again, it's like done here in little secret little pockets here and there because they make it because they, it's you know the legalities and all this stuff. You know, so that's 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 iboga. But in general, what psychedelics do <clears throat> is that. And I'm speaking both from personal experience, but also having worked with a lot of people with physical illness, chronic pain, uh, addictions, depression, anxiety, and so on. Given that all these conditions have a strong unconscious, trauma-based, stress-related template, can you imagine what could happen if we could, if we could break through in your psyche to where these stressful and traumatic memories and imprints are ingrained and if you could actually look at them and be present to them and to learn to relate to them in a different way if there was such a modality well psychedelics in many ways provide that modality because they get the conscious mind out of the way it's not that you're unconscious but they get the defenses so for example mdma it relaxes the amygdala now you're not so afraid anymore now you can talk about this stuff without fear, which means you can work it through. That's why MDMA works so well, works so well in PTSD. So there's different psychedelics. They're studying psilocybin or magic mushrooms now for stimulant addictions, nicotine addiction. I know people who off their nicotine after a couple of sessions of psilocybin. Um, so they work because not because of some, they're not drugs in the Western sense. See, if, I, if you came to me with depression and I prescribed for you an SSRI, a, a selective serotonin uptake inhibitor, you'd be taking it for months, possibly for years, possibly forever. These psychedelic substances are not there to change chronically the biology of your brain. They, they're there to reset your nervous system. That's what they're there to do. That's the best way I can put it. So that in the proper context again with the right guidance safe environment these can reset your brain reset your relationship to yourself reset your relationship to your body your whole physiology and that's why they work when they work that's why they work but i tell you you might have heard this many times, I certainly have, that that one experience with MDMA or that three ceremonies with ayahuasca or that psilocybin session, I learned a lot more and I got a lot more out of it than I did in 10 years of psychotherapy. And that's just how it works because your defenses are relaxed and you get to the stuff that's really there. And I'll say one final thing about psychedelics. <clears throat> They can be used irresponsibly, <clears throat> and, often, and too often they have been. So let's just let's just grant that. Number one, number two, they can be used exploitatively. When people are under the impact of a psychedelic substance, they're very vulnerable. They're very open. That means they're subject to abuse, and that's happened here in British Columbia in MDMA trials. It's happened in the Amazon jungle with ayahuasca. In every realm where there's power and vulnerability, you're gonna see exploitation. You're gonna see it in the church, in the medical profession, in psychiatry, in politics, everywhere. You also wanna see it in the psychedelic world. So we have to be aware of that. I also wanna say that from my experience, there's no such thing as a bad trip. So some people go into psychedelic experiences and they have experiences of unity and spiritual oneness and joy and, you know, that's beautiful. Some people have terror and fear and severe pain emotionally. I had a bad trip. No, you didn't. 
you had the trip or the journey or the experience you needed to have that terror that fear that emotional pain guess what you've been carrying it all your life it's what's been dominating your behaviors and psychedelic um, actually the term was coined to mean soul manifesting or mind manifesting so that these things manifest what you're carrying inside so now you can relate to them in a more conscious fashion that's what I can say to you about psychedelics in a nutshell. I mean, it's, it's a much longer conversation, and I'm glad you're getting a session on it. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's my particular take on it. It's a good nutshell. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We, we often have been talking psychedelics as acting as a catalyst, a catalyst meaning increasing the reaction. What you said is exactly what we hear all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it did more in that eight hours than five years of therapy. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's it. It's a catalyst to increase the speed of treatment, to help people get well. And I love that other part, to pull those, those, those barriers down to allow vulnerability, because really good therapy means also becoming vulnerable to the process. Uh, and by the way, without vulnerability, there's no growth. There and, it is. And, and, and one of the, and like, like, like a tree doesn't grow where it's hard and thick, does it? It goes where it's soft and vulnerable. Um, a crustacean animal like a crab can't go inside the shell. It has to molt and become vulnerable. And the same with human beings. And infants are very vulnerable. And what trauma does is it hardens us mm -hmm. as, as, a, it's, as a defensive measure. But inside that emotional hardness, we can't grow. So to, to be able to grow, we have to regain that vulnerability that you just uh, mentioned. Oh, I, I love that. We're, that's exactly what we were talking with Kristen Neff last night about was, you know, so many men uh, just won't go and talk about self-compassion and, and open themselves up. And we raise boys to push their emotions down and be strong. And uh, it, it really prevents vulnerability. It prevents growth. Uh, and it, it is part of our society. It is part of the childhood uh, uh, attachments that we've been discussing. You know, where we see this, you know where we see this a lot, very dramatically and often tragically, is in uh, first responders mm -hmm. um, and, and in the police force. A lot, a lot of the men, particularly who go into those professions, they have wonderful attributes, but they also have, they tend to have this natural self-image where we don't have sadness, we don't have pain, you know, all this kind of stuff. Right. Then they are exposed to all this trauma that they witness and they go into PTSD. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the healing of their PTSD is letting go of that carapace of macho toughness and getting them to be vulnerable. This is, anybody who's worked with veterans will tell you this. It's the same dynamic. You talk about my last couple of years of work. So uh, police officers, veterans, first responders. And you're right, the whole goal is to open up to yeah. accept that you must become vulnerable in order to move forward. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it's not just in first responders, but you know, there's the, the, the phrase that continues everywhere, time heals all. Well, time heals nothing when we talk about this. What you just said, it hardens us and it, it blocks us from moving forward. And all time really does is get everyone else used to living around you uh, if they decide to even do that. Uh, uh, but, you know, I was speaking to Jeff, I mentioned Jeff Rediger, who, who uh, you know, the Harvard psychiatrist who wrote the book on spontaneous healing. He was telling me that um, when he was in medical school, um, maybe as an intern, I forget, you know, he had his first newborn child. The child ended up in the ICU. They wouldn't give him time off to postpone his exams. Mm -hmm. But this is a common experience in medical school. What does that do? It hardens us. We have to be mature about it. We're not supposed to be upset when our child is in the ICU. Um, I could t tell you many such stories. I can tell you stories of medical students that I've talked with who actually take time to ask questions. And asking those questions relieves symptoms. But then they're reprimanded for spending too much time with the patient. Yeah, well, you, you just described a moral injury, right? And, and again, that moral injury is a part of the trauma in our lives, and that trauma in our lives hardens us, uh, 
makes us more emotionally reactive at times, uh, loses our anger control, uh, you know, leads to our families walking on glass around us. Uh, and, and we wonder, you know, why isn't, you know, I'll just go have a drink with the boys or, you know, I'll just uh, get over this. There, there isn't getting over it. You know, this is where we do need trauma thing, trained therapists. Yeah. What you mentioned before about the, the surgeon uh, asking about uh, trauma and then saying, I'm going to get you connected to someone who can help. There, yeah. there is the answer is having these therapists working inside of these programs. Right. Interdisciplinary care. Uh, it, we can't expect this. Or, and I, what did you say? The 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 baker and the the um, butcher. We can't expect the butcher to give you bread and the baker to give you meat. Yeah. Uh, but we can expect that when you're looking for meat, the baker is going to hey, the butcher's right next door. We're all in the same building. Perfect time for you to be here. Why can't our medical system do the same thing? Exactly. Exactly. Christelle had something more on this. Yeah, I, I kind of want to go back to um, not to segregate genders and what have you, but I know there was a lot of mention about mothers and um, I was listening to the two of you talk about uh, and referring to Kristen Neff's comments about self-compassion and we need supports and encourage uh, the men in our lives to access that. Um, there was just some discussion about the mother's role and I know you you were clear and I, I heard you say that there's no blame so how can we encourage then um, influencing and, and, and helping our fathers and what is the influence that our fathers might have through all of this yeah so that so that's a great question um, if you look at who gets autoimmune disease 80% of people with autoimmune disease are women. Now, there's a reason for that. And it's got nothing to do with genetics. It's got to do with the stress on women. Okay, in this society, as caregivers. And women are not only caregivers to their children, I hate to tell you, they're very often also emotional caregivers to their spouses in a way that's not reciprocated. And chronic caregiving, we know, damages the immune system. I could go into all kinds of studies that tell you that. It shortens telomeres, telomeres. So the problem in our society is that women are not supported. In fact, they're encouraged in their chronic caregiving role. So when it comes to mothers and fathers, well, look, it may not be fashionable to say so, but nature intended mothers to be with the infants. That's how nature intended it. If we're not gonna do that, we better compensate for it consciously. This is not a matter of keeping women barefoot pregnant in the kitchen. It's a question of realizing what the child's needs are. So if you look at hunter-gatherer societies, again, I mentioned there's aloe parenting, so a lot of Parents come in to support the parents in the child rearing role. It's not just a question of an isolated mom living in some bungalow. So there's that whole communal support, the extended family and all that. Men in the beginning need to be their supportive presences for their spouses. And I tell you what I've seen in family practice is that very often when a child comes into the picture, a lot of fathers are great. They become very supportive, nurturing, and so on. But some, they get a bit distanced because they feel a bit lost because the emotional nurturing that the mom was providing to them before they had a child now goes towards the baby. And the father's nose gets a bit out of joint. So in cases where I've seen postpartum depression, including in the case of myself and my spouse, it wasn't some isolated problem of the woman. It was a question of women not getting enough support. So we're not talking about people in isolation. We're talking about people in context. The hormones of, 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 of pregnancy may make somebody more sensitive just as around what they call the, you know, take something called the premenstrual syndrome. So people become irritable and short-tempered and so on before their period. We make a disease out of it. 
premenstrual syndrome and we prescribe medications for it. I'll tell you what I think is going on. Those hormones make women more sensitive so they're less able to put up with the usual stuff that they usually put up with. So they get more short-tempered and reactive as a result. That premenstrual symptom is telling them what stresses that they usually put up with, but now they have difficulty doing so. Traditional societies used to honor women who are having their periods. They call it the moon time. You know? So in other words, women, because they have the caregiving role of children and because they're sensitized by their hormones and their caregiving hormones like oxytocin and so on, they need more support. So the first job of the father is to be there as a support for the woman, not just dutifully washing the kitchen floor and doing the dishes. That's all good. But also as an emotional support. That's the first thing. Second thing is, there was an interesting study out of University of British Columbia. They looked at the epigenetics of teenagers. In other words, and Robert already mentioned epigenetics about how life experience changes gene expression, gene functioning. So they looked at the epigenetic functioning of teenagers. They found that stresses on the mother in the first couple of years of life has a large impact on the epigenetic functioning of teenagers. They looked at about 150 genes and 120 were affected by stresses on the mother. 30 were affected by stresses on the father in the preschool years. In other words, what happens? Usually in the first years, the mother is the primary caregiver. Then the father takes on more and more importance. And as the father becomes more important in the child's life, now his stresses end up affecting the child's genetic functioning. So what is the role of fathers? Well, the role of fathers, as in the role of the community, is to support the mother, provide the mom what she needs to be there. Because you see, human beings are born prematurely. We're actually born prematurely compared to other mammals. Our brain development is way behind a horse. A horse can run on the first day of life. In terms of our physiology, our enzymes, our, our, our physiological functioning, we're about nine months premature. The reason we're born nine months prematurely is because our head is the biggest. It can't, if it gets any bigger, we wouldn't get be born. But that means that after birth, there needs to continue a process of what the British anthropologist Ashley Montague called exterogestation. Interogestation being gestation in the womb, exterogestation being close body contact, breastfeeding, emotional support, holding. None of this business of putting the baby down, let, it, let the baby out to cry it out, teach themselves to sleep by ignoring their cries. None of that stuff. Aboriginal people don't do that. Animals don't do that. Babies need to be emotionally and physically held. Father's job is to support that, to, to as soon as possible start holding the baby themselves, not just for the sake of the baby, but when they hold the baby, their own brain circuits of care get triggered. So the more we hold an infant, the better fathers we become. It's that simple. The baby's teaching us physiologically. So that's the father's role. And it's not a question of blaming women because you see, again, it's a question of social conditions. And hence the title of my next book, which Rob mentioned, uh, The Myth of Normal trauma, illness, and healing in a toxic culture. This is a toxic culture because it, not just because of all the bad things it does, but because of all the, ne all the things, the good things that it deprives children and families of and, and, and the pressure it puts on women. And that's why women get all the antidepressants and they get not all of them, but most of them, anti-anxiety pills. And that's why they have more autoimmune disease because of the stress. And let me tell you one final study. I, you know, I just finished writing a book for 25,000 studies and some of them float around in my brain and one of them was done here in Canada. It's been well known that women do less well after coronary bypass surgery. So this one study looked at what happens. Men who have coronary bypass surgery, they get taken care of by their spouses. Women who get coronary bypass surgery, 
they start taking care of their husbands as soon as they go home. That one knocked my socks off. I think for pretty good reason. <laughs> it's, a, it's an unfortunate part of the society that we live in, and it's paternalistic. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're starting to see more and more feminism. We'll, we'll hear more about that from, from Kristen Neff as well, and uh, learning more about self-compassion. And, you know, that, that really leads us nicely into uh, resiliency. And, you know, it's a bit of a buzzword right now. Yeah. Um, we're hearing more and more about it. And uh, there's a lot of questions about it. So I'd like to get your, your thoughts on uh, resiliency. How do we create it and build it? And what does it really mean? Yeah. So this is where genetics do come in. So, you know, on the whole, I, there's a few genetic diseases. In other words, if you have a gene, you'll get the disease. Like there's one in my family, muscular dystrophy. My mother had it, my aunt had it. If you get the disease, you're gonna, you're gonna get, if you have the gene, you're gonna get the disease. But those are very rare. There's some cancer genes, like we know there's some, you know, genes for breast and ovarian cancer, but out of 100 women with the, with breast cancer, only seven will have the genes. And out of 100 women with the genes, far from all of them will get the disease. So even though the genes are important there, they're not in themselves decisive, not by themselves. And in most cases, they're not even there. In mental health conditions, this will come as a surprise to a lot of your listeners. Nobody has ever found a single gene for any mental health conditions. But if you have this gene, you're gonna get the disease. Nobody has ever found a group of genes that if you have this group of genes, you're gonna get this disease. None. What they found is a group of genes that if you have them, you're more likely to have one of any number of mental health conditions from ADHD to schizophrenia to whatever. In other words, there's no gene for the diseases. What are the genes for? sensitivity mm. in other words the more sensitive you are the more affected by you by the you're by the environment now this is in response to the question on resilience so just imagine this experience experiment right now i'm gonna tap myself on the shoulder you can do it to yourself you'll feel no pain <clears throat> but if you imagine that my shoulder was bare and there was a burn there so that my nerve endings were close to the surface and I tap myself with the same force, might have excruciating pain. In other words, if I was thin-skinned, there's an expression, thin-skinned. Mm. Well, some people are genetically more sensitive. That means that the same degree of external stimulus causes a lot more pain in them. Therefore, they're more prone to develop the mechanisms that lead to mental and physical illness. That's the only thing that's genetic here. But it, it relates to resilience. We tend to think of resilience as, well, what is resilience anyway? It, it's, you bounce back. So if you take a rubber ball and you squeeze it, and if you put a certain amount of pressure on it, when you let go, it'll revert to its original size. So it's got resilience. In human terms, I think resilience goes even beyond that. Because when I squeeze that rubber ball and it comes back to its normal size, it's not gonna be any bigger than it was before. But human beings have more than that. They actually have the capacity to grow from negative experiences. So resilience is not only surviving, but it's actually learning from and growing from difficult experiences. Now, that is not an individual quality. If you're very sensitive, and if the environment is painful for you, you're gonna have more defenses. Some of the world's murderers in jails are some of the most sensitive people because they were so badly hurt, they had to put out this hard shell. I'm not excusing anything. I'm just telling you how it works. Studies show that. And they all were terribly treated in childhood. On the other hand, I've worked in prisons. I've visited prisons and seen programs in San Quentin also here in Canada. Once they deal with their trauma, these people are soft and gentle and totally open-hearted. 
It's unbelievable the change. So resilience is not the not just the human capacity to rebound and to even grow, but it's a quality that needs social support. So resilience has a lot to do with the kind of help you get and the kind of community that surrounds you, the kind of attitudes with which people face you. So rather than looking at resilience as an individual quality, the question is, how do we promote resilience? We do it through compassion, through understanding, not to absolve people of what they've done. That's not the point here. But, you know, our, our indigenous peoples have this phrase called restorative justice. Well, what is being restored? The individual is restored to the community and the individual is restored to their true selves that got squeezed out of consciousness because of the childhood trauma. So for me, resilience has to do with uh, the kind of support that we provide people. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Uh, there, there's questions about that kind of resiliency and childhood trauma uh, and why some people with childhood trauma um, end up uh, not doing well with it and why others are more resilient. I think you kind of closed that out a bit with some of the genetics. Uh, and obviously what you just said, the support, uh, the, the external factors that come in, you know, a, a childhood has a trauma, but has two parents that create an attachment with that support that child and support them through the process versus a child has a trauma, doesn't have the attachments, doesn't have the resiliency. Well, you know, uh, I, you know, Alice Miller, the uh, British, uh, Swiss, Polish psychotherapist who wrote the drama of the gifted child, she's probably done more than anybody else in the world to alert the culture about childhood trauma. And she asked the very same question that you just raised about why some kids traumatize, they do okay, others don't. She said, what made the difference is what she called the presence of an empathetic witness. <laughs> Not even somebody who would necessarily rescue the child but just could validate the child's feelings. So that, so resilience therefore again is not an individual quality, it's a social quality. I love that invalidation and how important that is yeah. uh, and how important that is. I, I mean, it's a major part when we're, when we're uh, assessing people who are struggling with coping, uh, so-called borderline personality disorder. Uh, we talk lots about invalidation in childhood and childhood traumas, which again, I, I truly believe most personality disorders are just nothing more than, than coping and functioning after uh, childhood trauma and uh, ways to survive. Well, you know, um, to beat my own drum a bit, in my new book, uh, there'll be a couple of chapters on mental health conditions. That's exactly the case that I'm making. And, uh, and to take something like um, borderline personality disorder, first of all, The whole language assumes that there's something disordered about the person. You know, it's pathologizes something. Now, here's the thing about psychiatric diagnosis. They don't explain anything. People, they don't explain anything at all. You know how much evidence there is for serot lack of serotonin causing depression? You know how much evidence there is? Zero. That's how much evidence there is for it. Which doesn't mean that Prozac didn't help me. It did. You know, so again, I'm not here to vent against medications, but I'm just making a scientific case. So, so take something like borderline personality disorder. Is it a disorder or is it a normal response, as you suggest, to what happens? So if I don't trust people, which is one of the hallmarks of borderline personality disorder, if I was abused by my caregivers, is that mistrust pathology or is it a normal response? Problem is, as I pointed out earlier, quoting that Harvard article, those early coping mechanisms now get us into trouble. But, but that borderline personality disorder, it doesn't explain anything. Like you say, why doesn't that person trust anybody? Because they, because they have borderline personality disorder. How do we know they have borderline personality disorder? Because they don't trust anybody. Why don't, trust, why don't they trust anybody? Because they have this disorder. How do they have this disorder? Because, you know, uh, uh, somebody has bipolar disorder. How do we know? Because their moods go up and down. Why do the moods go up and down? Because they have bipolar disorder. 
How do we know they have bipolar disorder? Because the moves to go, I could go on and on. So just understand something, people. These diagnoses don't explain anything. They describe something. So when somebody is told you have borderline personal disorder, it describes how they function. That description may be helpful. When I was diagnosed with ADHD, <laughs> that description really helped me. Oh, okay, yeah, there's a pattern here. And I share that pattern with other people. But it didn't explain anything. It just described it. Mm -hmm. The explanation is, is that tuning out is how I survived my infancy. And I got programmed into my brain. That's the explanation. And now it's not just a question of treating the symptoms. It's a question of, uh, Gabor, how can we let you, how can we help you get into the present moment so you don't have to be tuning out all the time? And that's, that's been my challenge, you know? So diagnoses are, are, can be helpful as descriptions. They're totally useless as explanations. And as you suggest, Robert, in every case, they point to some childhood event for which those symptoms were originally compensations. Survival. Yeah, so we, we pathologize how someone was treated as a child by giving them a diagnosis. Exactly. Uh, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, social anxiety, anxiety disorders, major depressive disorders. Uh, you know, we're even taught in residency in psychiatry. Uh, what are the predisposing factors to major depression? Losses, adverse childhood experiences, which we should stop calling it an experience. It's a trauma. Uh, what happened to that individual, that child of witnessing violence in the home or being sexually abused or being uh, emotionally neglected. Those are traumas, not just experiences. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we need to focus on, on actually identifying and treating that piece and not just pathologizing and saying, this is what you have and, and good luck. I love that. The diagnosis doesn't do anything. Uh, you know, when it comes to understanding where it came from, what it's about. Yeah. You know, there, there is some questions about spirituality, and I know Christelle had it nicely laid out, and I'll pass it on to Christelle about spirituality. Sure, thanks. I, I've been hearing a lot about, uh, you know, moving forward, coping, uh, building resilience, um, biopsychosocial, and often spirituality or the spiritual aspects are added to that holistic approach. Um, we heard that yesterday with our diversity and inclusion um, mm. grouping. So I'm wondering, um, how has spirituality impacted your practice, um, Dr. Mate? And have you found spiritual or faith to be a part of understanding of trauma? Yeah. Well, certainly, we know that from studies that people that belong to religious communities, they tend to do better with anxiety, depression, unless those communities are abusive which often they can be, but you know, but that kind of social, psychological, spiritual support is very important. Um, people have also found spiritual experiences, realizations of, well, look, take something like anxiety. Anxiety, the assumption in anxiety, the hidden assumptions is that I'm all alone in a hostile world. That's the hidden assumption. Now that's a valid assumption based on your childhood experiences, because you were all alone and you experienced something that was very noxious to you. So that hyper alertness. Now, um, I mentioned the work of Dr. Yak Panksep, the uh, neuroscientist. I just love quoting him because he's just so illuminating. And so that we have the system for rage, for care, for seeking, the dopamine. We also have what is called the panic grief system. The panic grief system is what gets triggered when we get separated from care. The child should have a panic grief system to alert him or her or they to the loss of, 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 of adult attachment, in which case the child will start expressing their panic by wailing. We should bring the adult running, which should trigger the adult's care system. And okay, <laughs> But if that doesn't happen, that panic gets ingrained in the brain as a chronic condition. So what becomes as a compensation, what becomes as a coping mechanism, now becomes a source of distress and in medical terms, what we call pathology. But it's based on the assumption that I'm all alone in a dangerous world. 
well, let's say you do have a spiritual path, you do mindfulness, or you do prayer, or you do psychedelics, or you do uh, yoga. Yoga, by the way, means unity. That's what it means. And you realize that you're not an isolated little creature in a hostile universe. You're part of something wondrous and huge and way beyond imagination. All of a sudden, you're not alone. So, of course, your anxiety um, abates. And by the way, this is what they found in Johns Hopkins University. They did studies with psilocybin and of uh, magic mushrooms and end of life anxiety. And what did they find? After these unitary spiritual experiences with psilocybin, people had less anxiety. <laughs> Why? Because they were no longer isolated little creatures in the hostile universe. So, you know, the 12 steps. Um, we could talk about the pros and cons of the 12 steps, but the 12 steps themselves, I think, are wonderful. And they talk about the God of your understanding. Well, for people, some people, that language is very off-putting, and it's kind of old language, really. <laughs> Um, and especially if people grew up in homes where their religion was beaten into their heads, they may really resist that language. But if you forget that language, and if you just think of God not as a creature or an old man in the sky with a beard, but as the unifying principle in the universe, something that we're all a part of and belong to, well, that can heal. That can help heal your addiction. And appealing to your higher power which doesn't have to be, again, some personified God. It can be. I'm not here to either suggest or dispute anyone's religious beliefs. But that higher power could be through nature, nature out there, your conscience, love. How would this not help <laughs> when you think about it? Because, and I say physiologically, because what do you feel physiologically when you, when you feel a part of something bigger, like a community? What do you feel physiologically when you experience love? It's a very different feeling. Of course, spirituality is healing. What else could it be? I'm not talking about religion. It could be religious. For some people, it doesn't have to be. I'm talking about spirituality. And all too often, I see people who are religious, but not in the least spiritual. Mm -hmm. In other words, they have a set of beliefs, but there's no sense of that experience of unity or that even craving for it. Thank you so much for bringing the conversation to the whole person. Um, and uh, um, it's hard to believe we only have five minutes left. Um, I'm going to pass back to Rob for maybe one of our last questions. And I think we could keep talking on and on. Unfortunately, we want to respect your time. And we have some wonderful speakers coming up too. So um, I'll pass it back to you, Rob. Absolutely. Look, I, I mean, I'm in big agreement with you on the 12 steps. Uh, there's a few things that I like about it. Uh, it does need to be kind of rewritten of, of 12 step facilitation to be uh, slightly rewritten, which there are kind of AA for atheists and uh, yeah. focusing on that spiritual and not religious part. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask a, a final question that I think is quite interesting and, and uh, quite important in the moment today. A lot of people have stayed home over the last 18 months with COVID. A lot more parenting, children not even going to school. Uh, you know, a lot of people have talked about, well, there's been more violence, um, more uh, um, domestic violence, uh, women uh, showing up more at shelters. I, I have no doubt uh, that, is, that is absolutely the case as you've kind of jammed a people with toxic relationships and in, in a toxic world into a home where they have no escapes. Yes. But that's not the case in all, all uh, matters. And there may be an opportunity of seeing more attachment, more mothers and fathers being home with their kids, whether they liked it or not. Uh, I'm curious on your thoughts of the long-term outcomes of almost two years of people working at home and being around the kids. And, um, uh, you know, both the good, the bad, and the indifferent. Well, you know, I, I think the answer is embedded in your question. Um, when, you when you put stress on a weak system, it's going to reveal all the fault lines, <laughs> all the fractures. So before COVID, in a family where there were real unresolved tensions between the spouses, but they each went off to work, or the guy went to the football game on Sundays, and 
relieve some of the stresses and tensions. It kind of functioned in a in a way the the stresses were more hidden. They were there, but they were they didn't have to be confronted. Now then you take those same people and you isolate them in a home, and there's not the usual stress relievers of social activity, friendships, sports, the bar, whatever people use those tensions are going to increase and those fault lines are going to be broader and the, the, the latent toxicity in the relationship will be revealed. And we've seen that just as you say, there's more kids showing up in emergency wards with head injuries now, for God's sakes. In healthy families though, you're going to get the opposite effect. And uh, I've seen a lot of parents say, my God, I got to see my child's milestones. I got to see them learn a new task. I got to play with them. I've learned so much. So I've seen both. And so that, that second response shows you what's possible. What's possible. And uh, again, it, 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 trauma is not what happens to us. I didn't say this, but I may as well end with it. Trauma is not what happens to us. Trauma is what happens within us as a result of what happens to us. So this COVID thing has been traumatic for some people and it will have been a source of resilience for other people. And unfortunately, Jesus was right. For those, those who have, more shall be given to them. And for those who don't have, even little they have will be taken away. That's how it works psychologically and spiritually. When you have fewer resources, when you're under stress, you may lose those resources. And when you're more richly endowed, you will actually become that much more um, rich emotionally and relationally. And I think we're seeing both during the COVID crisis. And again, you know, to bring it back to your really important persistent question about what do we do as a society? Well, what if we as a society recognize all this? What if we learned the lessons of COVID? I mean, what have we learned from COVID? That people need each other. That's what we've learned. Now the question is, are we gonna apply that? Or are we gonna go back to the same normal, which had us separated? In England now, there's a minister of loneliness for God's sakes. So, I mean, on that happy note, I suppose I have to come to an end here. <laughs> well, on one of the most powerful uh, uh, events in a conference that I've ever been involved in, thank you. Well, thank, you so uh, thank you for your time, for your honesty, for just being able to sit down and have a conversation. Uh, I think one of the most powerful ways to bring a message to others is just to be able to talk about it. And your ability to translate complex and difficult processes uh, in, in simple manners for all of us to understand uh, is really such a, uh, an incredible skill to have. And thank you for sharing that skill and your knowledge and uh, helping change practice and empower people who are living day to day with pain every single day. And I think you were able to do both of those. And if we can keep perpetuating that, that knowledge that trauma is treatable, time does not heal all, and that we can get better as a society, uh, it's huge. And, uh, you know, we, we were blessed to have that message from you today. And thank you so much, Dr. Well, let me just say that. Thank you for inviting me to do what I love doing. So Take care. Oh, of course. It We're sure on. showed through. Thank you so much. And we look forward to, um, you know, I echo Rob's sentiments. Uh, we look forward to seeing your book in, in autumn 2022. The, that, that, that title is striking, The Myth of Normal, yeah. uh, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in the Toxic um, Culture. So thank you so much for your time, uh, your contributions. And um, we look forward to uh, hearing more about you in the future. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.